It's a pleasure to be here to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about my profession, which is human factor psychology. Um, I don't know Michael Gordon personally, but we had exchanged a few emails before I got here, and I must tell you, it's truly an honor to be included in the list of distinguished leaders who have been asked to give this Michael Gordon lecture in the past years. Uh, in keeping, I guess, with the theme of this meeting, Michael Gordon's not somebody who's ever rested on his laurels. I think throughout his entire career, he's somebody you could look at and say, you know, at each juncture, there are things that we can do that we can do better. And in the words of Michael Seropian, the innovation and the creativity just seems to keep on flowing. It just seems to expand. And I think he was, epitomizes the idea of taking things and taking it one step better. I'm going to talk today. Oh, actually, I'm going to go ahead and move this over here. These are my disclosures. And this is the content of my lecture today. I want to talk to you a little bit about human factors, what I think human factors can contribute to healthcare safety, and talk a little bit more about the human factors perspective on human error, and then I want to show some examples of how simulation is being used to, uh, to study challenges to healthcare providers, and then I want to share a little bit with you about our profession. So let me begin with a definition. Human factors is a discipline concerned with designing systems that complement or accommodate the strengths and limitations of human users. That really doesn't capture the breadth of human factors. Human factors is really at the intersection of what we understand of how the mind works and how the body works across a wide variety of engineering applications. So we take information about psychology, information about biomechanics, and we apply it in a variety of different engineering applications. And yet at the intersection, there are a couple of things that are really unique about how people interact with their work, their work environment and their tools that are really the staples, I would say, of what we do in human factors. We look at errors and process control and situation awareness and cognitive engineering and workload. I should also mention that we look at these things at the individual level, at the team level, and the organization level. Human factors, the application areas are incredibly broad. Automated systems, communication systems, software systems, computer hardware software, medical systems, health systems, virtual reality tools and equipment. The people in our profession work in a wide variety of different types of applications and products. So why are we interested in human factors? Well, it turns out that when we don't pay attention to people's limitations, oftentimes it makes headlines. I think many of you are familiar with the incident at Three Mile Island. Sometimes the headlines can be fairly recent. In fact, this has been a particularly bad month for the maritime industry. Now, all these situations here do not necessarily have to result in fatal consequences, but they still can be life-changing events. Or sometimes they can just be plain aggravation and annoyance. Sometimes our successes do grab headlines as well. Captain Sully Sullenberger has a master's degree in industrial psychology from Purdue University, and it was actually responsible for implementing a lot of the crew resource management technology at United uh, US Airways. Let me talk briefly about the history of human factors. There are documented uh, uh, pieces of documentation throughout history that talks about, uh, talk about where people have tried to improve human performance. But in the United States, we typically go back to the work of Frederick Taylor and, and his interest in management science uh, as where human factors began. Shortly thereafter, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth were also involved in it, and their approach to improving performance was to look at motion analysis and eliminate unnecessary motions in how workers performed. And interestingly enough, they were responsible for the concept of a scrub tech, what they called a surgical caddy, because they found out that it was much more efficient for somebody to hand the instruments to a surgeon than to have the surgeon turn around and grab them from a tray. The history of human factors really exploded after World War II. We established laboratories, formal laboratories, here in the United States and Great Britain. Alphonse Chapanis, sometimes thought of as the grandfather of human factors, published the first book in 1949. We started, as I said, professional societies in Europe and the United States about that time. 
And Chapandis and Safran published two papers on medication errors. They did a human factors analysis of medication errors in 1960 in the Journal Hospital. In the 1960s, Human Factors was heavily involved in the Apollo and space missions, and we had a wonderful presentation yesterday by Joe Schmidt talking about some of the work that they've done in that area, and our profession contributed significantly to the 1960s. But probably from the 70s on, the, thing, the area where we've had the greatest impact would be in the design of human-computer interface. We're largely responsible for moving the computer out of large rooms in, in, in engineering centers and making it ubiquitous so that all of us now use computers. I had the word iotrogenic harm in my title. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but iotrogenic harm you can think of as a side effect. It is an unattended consequence of interaction with the medical system. So unfortunately, medicine has had its own fair share of headlines due to problems with errors, human error, and safety. And as in the other types of high-risk industries, they also tend to catch the public's attention and grab, uh, make headlines as well. And all of these have appeared after the IOM report was published. By contrast, the aviation industry has become fairly safe. This was just appeared recently. It said we had another outstanding year. Aviation is still one of the safest forms of transportation. I often show this slide to put where medical errors are in terms of perspective. Medical errors, these data were gathered from the health grades report, which has been pulling the Medicare records every year for the last, I guess, about six years. And they have shown that medical errors are indeed pretty serious. They lead to a lot of fatalities. What I want to point out here is they lead to almost three times the number of fatalities in a year as people die on our highway system. About four times as many as people are actually killed due to homicide about 20 times more, or 10 times more, I should say, than the total casualties we've lost in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And again, I've already talked about how safe commercial aviation is. So I think, in keeping with the theme, I do believe that we can probably do better. I often talk about where human factors can contribute to healthcare simulation. And these are 10 areas where I think the people in our profession we have many people in our profession working on areas that are absolutely relevant to healthcare simulation. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these today, but I do want to highlight training because we have been doing a tremendous amount of work in training. We understand how to conduct a needs analysis. We understand training methods, how to evaluate training, how to calculate transfer of training to the actual operational or the operational environment. We understand how to do performance assessment, cognitive assessment, workload assessment. We understand to calculate the cost effectiveness of the training. We know a lot about team training. We know about the nature of teams, how teams work together, how they think, how they communicate, how you assess teams, the factors that moderate teams, why teams perform better, and the things that hinder the ability of teams to work well together, how you design effective uh, instructional uh, training systems for teams, in fact, Eduardo Salas is probably one of the most foremost experts on teams, a member of our society, and other members of Human Factors were instru uh, instrumental in working with the Department of Defense and AHRQ on the development of the Team Steps curriculum that many of you are probably familiar with. But it was developed by taking scientific principles and evidence across a wide variety of domains where teams work and applying it directly to the nature of healthcare teams. However, today what I want to concentrate on is human error. I picked human error because actually, in my opinion, that's the reason I think we're all here. We're interested in training and education, we're interested in the technology, but ultimately we're interested in all of those because we want to try and eliminate the errors that we see in the workplace. First thing I want to say is that there are different types of errors and not all errors are the same. There are mistakes. <laughs> like not turning off the sound. <laughs> Mistakes can be either rule-based or they can be uh, uh, um, knowledge-based. It can be an in, inappropriate plan that is uh, implemented in the right circumstances or a uh, correct plan that's implemented in the wrong circumstances. There can be slips. Slips is a lapse of, or excuse me, slips of forgetting to do something. It's usually an automatic activity that gets implemented, usually when your attention is diverted away for something. It's the right activity, but the circumstances are generally wrong for its particular implementation. 
And then there are lapses. Lapses are a failure of attention or memory. It's when you forget to do something. For instance, if you forget to leave or you forget to take your cell phone with you when you leave at the end of the session at the end of the day. The problem is that training is fairly effective in helping to people manage mistakes. You can train people to be better at how to form, formulate their plans and when to implement their plans. Unfortunately, slips and lapses are a little bit less amenable to training because they represent failures of memory and attention. So the point I want to make here is that training, one of the reasons we're here, is absolutely vital for limiting iatrogenic harm, but is not sufficient. In human factors, we understand that there are a number of moderators that impact user performance. We can study the user, the characteristics of the user himself or herself, study the task that they have to do. What are the task demands that the user is asked to complete? What tools do they need to be effective in getting the task accomplished? And that network that you see there is embedded in an environment and an organization. And all of this together impacts human performance, the effectiveness of our workers. Now, human factors, our birth, was largely born out of uh, problems that came from World War II. And many instances started as a con consequence of the war effort showed that you could take well-trained workers or pilots who were highly motivated in circumstances where their lives were at stake and found out that they could not overcome poor design. One of the, the uh, uh, examples that's near and dear to me is vigilance. Vigilance refers to the ability to maintain attention on a given task for an extended period of time. Norman Mackworth was asked by uh, uh, the, Royal, uh, excuse me, the British Royal Air Force to understand why radar and sonar operators were missing signals, signals that would allow German U-boats to, to get into the Bay of Biscay. So what he did to study this problem is he created a simulation. He simulated a radar display. And what I'm going to show you is an example of what's called the Mackworth clock test. You're going to see the hand, the vertical bar, sweep around the face of the clock, and it sweeps a certain amount of distance. And occasionally, it will make a double jump. When you see it make a double jump, raise your hand. Ah, very good. Most of you see it? That's great. You're supposed to see it. It's supposed to be a, 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 an event or a stimulus that's easy to detect under alerted conditions. What Mackworth had his participants do is watch that display for two hours. <laughs> and here's what he found. Now, his axes are, are, are distorted here. Um, he's plotted misses on an inverted axis. But the basic picture I want you to see is people started off at a reasonable level of performance, not perfect performance like you all just did. And the performance dropped off within the first half hour and continued to drop off for each subsequent uh, time period after that. It turns out that this is called the vigilance decrement. It is probably one of the most replicable findings in all of human factor psychology, perhaps all of experimental psychology. And what it shows is that people in these types of situations will either show a decrease in accuracy or an increase in time it takes to respond as a function of time. These are people that are simply asked to do, all they're asked to do is watch a display and make a response when they see it. Now it turns out this is hard to train people to do. A lot of training, you can get people to improve their overall levels of accuracy, but it, training cannot overcome the vigilance decrement. But this would not happen in healthcare, right? No, not at all. Well, Matt Weinger and his colleagues were some of the first people to show that anesthesiologists are susceptible to vigilance problems, and particularly so when they're in busy, when they're in the pre-intubation stages as opposed to post-intubation. In my own laboratory, we've been looking at the ability to of people to detect critical signals in maternal fetal heart rate tracings. Well, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with this, the target here would be a deceleration in the fetal heart rate that has its onset after the peak of a, 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 a contraction, whereas in the bottom right-hand corner, you have one that coincides with the contraction, and that's what we call a neutral event. That's not of any serious concern. So we asked people to look for these critical signals in these tracings as a function of time. And here's what we found. Over a 45 minute vigil, the ability to detect those signals declined as a function of time. 
And the busier you were, the worse you did. So that watching one display, you did quite well. But as you had to watch multiple displays simultaneously, your ability to detect those signals declined more dramatically. Here's another example I want to show you. OK, I'm going to show you a short video clip. And at the end, I'll have a question for you. Where do you think we should place the uh, other staple? Maybe higher or a little bit? Oh, uh, I don't know where. Maybe a little bit lower. Like somewhere around in this area, yeah. you think so? Well, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we said lower? Yeah, or? a little bit lower I think would be good. Somewhere in this area? Yeah. How many spotted the error? Serious, serious error. The kind of thing that likely, if you didn't discover the error, you'd be subject to litigation. Here's a before and after. The first part of the video that you see, there are three staples on that structure. After the camera moves, there are only two staples. Why was that so hard to detect? Well, it turns out that the brain has problems when there are interruptions. Your ability to monitor the world is made up of little slices of time for where your mind is, con is conscious right now and where it predicts you're going to be in the next few milliseconds. And when you disrupt that, it doesn't have the cognitive glue to, group, to, to put those scenes together and makes you particularly susceptible to these types of errors. This is a, a tasking continuity. Is, it masks changes in the flow of dynamic information. Again, this is a problem that we're susceptible that is not amenable to training. So how do we get rid of these problems? We know these people have problems. One thing we can do is, well, we get rid of the unreliable people. If people are unreliable, we'll replace them with more reliable technology. So we build barriers. Barriers are methods to contain errors. They are put in place to either prevent or stop the propagation of errors. And they include warning systems. And, uh, sensors and human machine redundant systems and fail safe mechanisms. And there are a lot of people in our profession that spend a great deal of time creating effective barriers. I don't want to uh, um, bemoan this or say that this is not effective. This is a very valuable way that we can contain errors. But again, I have to caution you that if you focus only on the tools, the barriers, you can't expect the greatest amount of success by ignoring the task, the user, and the environment in which people work. As one example in the literature is filled with many, there is an analysis that was performed of a computerized physician order entry system which was designed to limit errors, errors in the order systems. In an analysis, they showed that this particular system actually facilitated 22 types of medication error risks including using the system to determine loads, uh, low doses and dosage ranges that were actually built into the system based upon how the pharmaceutical company shipped the drugs. They weren't based upon clinical guidance. Or increased uncertainty of patient meds by having to flip through a variety of different pages on the system. Some error risks were discovered or observed 50 to 90% of the house staff and occurred weekly. And the house staff often had to develop workarounds to avoid the problems. The problem, I'm here to tell you, is not human error. Error is a consequence of interaction with technology rather than the cause of adverse events. What we in the human factors community have begun to understand is that well-intentioned technology changes the nature of work. Often, it succeeds in improving tasks for which it was designed. It does what it's supposed to do. It limits this set of errors but it changes the nature of work and can introduce latent consequences that can manifest themselves in unexpected ways. So barriers then, to be effective, need to be considered and tested at the individual level and within the context we expect them to be used. So we've started to do some rethinking about human errors. Human error is not a cause of failure. It ends up being a symptom of failure. There are two types of biases that tend to limit our ability to see past the adverse event itself. One is the hindsight or outcome bias. Errors are easy to identify once they've happened. 
But local rationality refers to the idea that we're in the midst of doing things, we don't see the errors. In fact, each of you will make an error probably today. Some of you maybe already have. You'll stub your toe, you'll spill some coffee, you'll enter the wrong session room, you'll get there late. They won't be necessarily life-threatening types of errors, but they will be errors. The point I want to make is you won't realize you've made the error until the error happens because errors populate. They come out of normal consequences, the way we normally work, the way we interact, the way we do our jobs. They are a consequence of the entire technology, the user of the technology, and the environment. And they're, like I said, they're easy to identify afterwards. If they were easy to identify beforehand, we'd never make them. There are also organizational risks. A major source of patient safety risk lies with the organization in which people work, the administration, and the technology that's embedded in it. Decker has told us that organizations are susceptible to what he calls organizational drift. And what happens is that small changes in policy that are used to manage workload can compromise safety. So things that should be the safety prescription say you should do X, we find out that we well, don't have time to do X all of the time, but we never get an adverse event from having changed, that ends up becoming the new policy. And then a year or two from now, we find out, well, we've been doing well so far, maybe we can increase production or increase our, our uh, resources and shorten it some more. And over successive years, these things start to become institu instituted policies and then tend to have a big impact when they finally come to a head. The World Health Organization recognized this and then concluded that the current conceptual thinking of patient safety places the prime responsibility for adverse events on deficiencies in system design, organizations, and operation rather than on individual providers or the individual products. Again, it gets back to that system that I showed you earlier. There are a number of organizations that do have very good safety records, and success seems to be achieved not by focusing on the erroneous actions or violations, but on the mechanisms that turn those erroneous actions and violations into common acceptable norms, the way we do business. We need to be able to examine how changes create or change creates potential new vulnerabilities in the system. How are we going to do that? Simulation. Dave Gabba, several years back, published, a, I think, a very important article where he talked about 11 applications of simulation in healthcare. The first one is the purpose and the aims of the simulation activity. And he talked about education, training, assessment, rehearsal, and research, and he gave a nod to human factors there. Well, what I'd like to show is an example of how we use simulation to study how people interact with tools and technology. And the example I'm going to show you is a paper by Manzi that was uh, recently published in the Human Factors Journal. The Human Factors Society held a competition and gave an award for the best application of human factors principles to healthcare, and this was the paper that won the award. And what Manzi and his colleagues were studying was a navigation system, a system for navigational control that provides continual tracking of an instrument in safe zones, and if you breach the safe zone, it prevents you from moving any further. And he wanted to say, if we were teaching people to perform this mastoidectomy with this device, what impact would it have on user performance and workload? So he, he ran a study, used advanced medical students. The procedure was a simulated mastoidectomy, and this is what they found. They found safer results from relatively inexperienced surgeons, which is a good thing, but they came at a cost. The, there were interruptions in workflow caused by the system that prevented movements, which increased completion times substantially, increased frustration levels, and actually reduced situation awareness. So again, unintended consequences of this particular system. Now, David had actually 11 applications of simulation in healthcare. There are a lot of ways that we can use simulation, tremendous, uh, 11 different ways, and a great way to expand the way that we use simulation from what we're currently doing. In my own uh, uh, institution, we're working with Eastern Virginia Medical School to create a simulation, what I call a laboratory, for studying individual contextual and barrier effects on errors in healthcare. 
We've known for quite some time that each one of these factors has an impact on safety in the operating room or human performance in the operating room, the design of physical devices, the ergonomic layout of the operating room. We know about individual performance, and we probably know about team performance, but teams are embedded in an organization, and the organization can either have a direct or indirect impact on performance. The organization is embedded in a much larger organization or society or culture that can also impact how the organization behaves. Current medical simulators, if you look at the exhibit hall, are doing a great job of targeting these particular areas. But there are still these other areas that we know people are susceptible in the operating room. It would be nice to have a way to investigate those. So we've been building what we call a virtual operating room. This will allow us to, well, actually, I talk about, the, in this case, a training application, a procedure for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We've got computer-generated surgical team members, each with their own knowledge structure and verbal responses and physical movements that are based on cognitive task analyses for each of the members of the surgical team. And they're developed with dialogue structures that are based upon that task analyses and that knowledge base. We project it into a, uh, a cave of a, vir a virtual environment. And in this clip, what you're going to see is a trainee going through an exercise. This is a, a surgeon that knows how to do a lap coley, but in this case, they're going to perform it in the context of the virtual environment. Patients within the virtual operating room. Thank you. Are you ready to begin? Yes. You may begin by placing the remaining four cards. Okay. Okay. Are you happy with the placement of all trocars? Yes. The patient's sacks are decreasing to 88%. Are you having trouble? I'm not having trouble. Mm -hmm. Full sacks seems okay. How are the sacks? Dr. Crump, ask about the abdominal pressure. Pressure. In this case, she's being prompted. And sufflation has decreased to 5 millimeter Hg. Call, are you having trouble ventilating? No, but have an elevated temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. The system is waiting for her to respond. Do you have dantrolate? We have to stop the case at this point. Dr. Krupp, what is our next step? I would say uh, IV fluids, dantrolene. That is correct. Care unit. Let's get dantrolene and malignant hypothermia cart. Thank you. Simulation ended. So, this type of environment opens up the possibility of creating the virtual context we need to be able to manipulate things that we wish to study. Whether it's the layout of equipment, you'll probably see the, the anesthesia cart was probably in a different location than most of you are familiar with. But we can manipulate the team performance. We can have virtual teammates or we can have real teammates performing the exercises. We can examine the impact of organizational policy on how it affects people either directly or indirectly within the context and environment that we have complete and total control over. I suspect that errors in healthcare will decline as the breadth of simulation expands. I guess the message I'd like you to take home today is that if you think what we're seeing now is, uh, is a good start, it is a good start, but there's a lot more coming. There's a lot more on its way. We in the human factors community use simulation in so many forms that I would not be able to do my job without it. We use it for prototypes and mock-ups to be able to fabricate what we think would be a logical solution to a design. We use it in terms of laboratory testing. We use it in iterative testing for potential users to make sure that our designs are meeting the objectives that we intend. We use it in pilot tested, in simulated environments to be able to see whether our solutions and our ideas are being uh, uh, validated within the context we expect people to perform. 
I also have the privilege of working with the Virginia Modeling Analysis and Simulation Center at Old Dominion University. It's a place where people have a lot of knowledge about fundamentals of simulation in a variety of areas, apply them across a wide range of different application domains. Now, it's not unique. There is an entire industry of simulation folks that are developing and working on simulation in domains that are unrelated to healthcare. It's not that I mean, it's uh, um, unimportant work. We have a lot to learn from people that are doing work in these other areas. And frankly, I think they have a lot to gain by having uh, some understanding of what we're doing in healthcare. So there's a huge wealth of resources that people in our community have to draw upon to get simulation up to some of the next levels that I think are coming down the pike. I started by saying that there are a number of areas where people in our profession can contribute to simulation in healthcare. I'll also mention that these that I didn't talk about today are absolutely applicable to the design of the technology that we're developing right now. We have people that know a great deal about haptic perception, virtual environments, simulator fidelity, simulator sickness, methods and techniques that would be valuable to this community. These are some of the publications of the folks that work in our discipline. If you'd like to know more about the work that we do or want to look for other applications and simulation that might be relevant, I encourage you to thumb through some of these resources. There are a number of professional organizations, the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, the International Ergonomics Association, uh, Division 21 of APA, where people like myself uh, are available for, uh, uh, for expertise. We have chapters throughout the entire United States. There are many places where people have human factors laboratories that are doing work here and across the globe. There are many more chapters of the International Ergonomics Association of Federated Societies as well. So there are a lot of folks that are doing work out there that I think would be important to be more connected to our community and for our community to be more connected with them. Plus there are a lot of challenges that lie ahead that I think would benefit from human factors. Personnel shortages, shortcomings in medical education, shortcomings in medical information systems. Do these things sound familiar to you? Would it be surprising to know that this was published in 1970? I think together we can do much better. I think there's a lot of great opportunity for us in the years and ahead. I hope that you will call upon people in the profession more often to get involved with the work that you're doing. And at this point, I'd like to make a confession, and the confession is I really have no formal medical training. <laughs> what I have learned about healthcare and medicine has been because I've had some very uh, uh, important and knowledgeable and kind people in the medical and healthcare profession take me under the wing and educate me about the challenges that they face. So I'd like to acknowledge their contributions to what I've learned about healthcare. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my students because I probably learn more from them than they learn from me. And with that, I'll let you get to your coffee break. <laughs>